I'm going to be quite brief because with one or two exceptions, I don't think there's anybody in the room who doesn't know pretty much everything I'm going to say. And that's because, remember, this was a dialogue that was originally designed to be held on both sides of the Atlantic. And on that side, Pete and I had quite a long time. So I'm going to say, and over there I said, but I'm not going to give you the detail because I would assume that with one or two exceptions in the room, you know what I'm going to say. So you get the shorthand version, whereas you've had the magisterial overviews from Terry and from Mike. Does that make sense? But if, you, if I lose you, wave and we'll pick it up in discussion. We've got lots and lots of time. So my role over there was to talk about the role of, as we still tend to call them, consultants and contractors in the UK, but say commercial archaeology. Uh, I made the point that the UK is actually four countries, not, not one, so that's fine. Picks up on Pete's point about being international in a slightly perverse way, but there we are. Um, we have about 5,500 archaeologists inhabiting the jungle. It's a difficult one. We have the inverse of the situation that Terry described, where our, our policy and regulation tends to be from the bottom up rather than federally imposed from the top down. And um, in, in that situation, uh, we have, say, 5,500 individuals who really belong to what I called three genera, the, the curators, the consultants, and the contractors. Uh, and, and I will argue, happy to argue, in fact, that, that those are all pretty much useless labels. Uh, we're, we're pretty much all archaeologists. Some people have a responsibility for making decisions in that bottom-up decision-making process, uh, and others have responsibility for implementing the outcomes of, of those decisions. Um, but that the process by which that happens is at one level run through our very few nationally uh, imposed laws and by and large regulated through county level uh, policy documents and then lower, uh, unit, we call them unitary, you, we call them unitary authorities and so on. So we have at that middle level the point at which archaeology really comes into play in the commercial sector. That's quite different from the USA. And that that interplay, that middle ground, actually affects the vast majority of our historic environment. We have about, uh, well, I actually worked out the figures because the Americans needed to know them. We've got about, say, 20,000 scheduled monuments, 9,000 listed one, listed grade one, 21,000 listed grade two, SAR, et cetera, et cetera. And on the HERs, we've got well over a million sites. So, and those million sites are by and large not affected by our national legislation. So it is very much a, a very different and uh, inverted situation that pertains in the USA. But we've got the, the, groups, the groups of people who are responsible for seeing that the work's done and then for doing the work. Um, so amongst those, we have the CIFA membership. I think that's predominantly represented in this room. Uh, I won't do hands up, but that would be interesting. Uh, we think we've got well over 50% of the self-identified archaeologists working in the UK. We're underrepresented, we know we are, in academia, in some of the national agencies and or other institutions like that. But we are very well represented in the commercial sector, which was my responsibility, along with Mike, for this dialogue. And, and we achieve a lot more than that by way of the registered organization scheme, which, because that applies to companies, we actually then kind of capture or encapsulate far more individuals and they are then responsible for adhering to our code and our standards than they might otherwise because they haven't joined individually. Uh, I'll, I'll again, come back and give you some of the numbers, but we've got like something like 77 ROs at the moment. And the registered, process, the registered organization process is another thing which distinguishes us from the situation on the other side of the Atlantic. And the, part of the rationale here was simply that the commercial archaeology is actually a contractual relationship between organizations. It's not an individual. Some of us may sign a contract, but on behalf of a company. So to only try to regulate, in our mind some years ago, to only try and regulate things by enforcing the individual might not have been viewed as very successful. But if an organization is responsible in some ways for adhering to a code and to standards, then there's a more enforceable route, a route way for, for more effective enforcement of the code and the standards. <coughs> so that assesses 
the RO process assesses the capability of organizations to adhere to the CIFA code, just like the validation process uh, assesses their ability to adhere, an individual's ability to adhere to the code and to the standards. Uh, and we reckon about 75, actually probably more than that, 80, maybe even 85% of the commercial archaeologists in the UK are, by this mechanism, uh, responsible for operating in, in adherence with, our, with the organization, the ZIFA um, code. So we have the ROs, they're committed to comply with the code, we, we try to enforce quality of work, the publication record, I won't read all these, these are all the things, that, whoops, let's just go back. Those are the things that the ROs are going to be responsible for doing. Um, and if they don't, there is the complaint process, which is viewed not as a, not so much as a quasi-judicial process, but more as a mechanism for trying to improve standards and performance. Um, but nonetheless, it's quite effective and it happens, it's not always as well publicized as perhaps it should be, but it is something that does happen quite regularly. So I would say it's a fairly effective process. And again, that's not something which is paralleled on the other side of the Atlantic. Amongst the ROs, I went through uh, the process by which organizations become registered. And uh, these were some of the key points. And the, la the last one, I think, um, there we go, is, is an important one because it doesn't assume that an organization that starts off with good aspirations and a good process is going to maintain those over time. So registration is time limited. And you have to, as an organization, demonstrate your continuing ability to adhere to the code and to the standards. I tried to describe the process we're in, which is not unlike that that Terry described, a push-pull situation, encouraging uh, and, and requiring in, in equal measure where we have some measure of influence. So see for membership or registration as an organization is I said increasingly required, and I think that's right, although the numbers, we're not reaching a tipping point yet, but there are counties in the UK which require work to be done either by an RO or for the work to be led by an MCIFA. And we work on the other side by encouraging where we can the commercial employers of us to expect that the work would be done by an RO or by an MCIFA um, because it's their way of ensuring quality on the negative side it's risk management on the positive side it's actually the one way that they can be most assured of getting the benefits out of the work they fund for their own shareholders and their own stakeholders so push pull but i think and, and i explained over there and I, and I do firmly believe it is a process which is becoming increasingly effective as the years have gone on see if a produces not just one um, standards for research, but rather 13 practice standards, uh, standards and guidance, I should say. Um, and there's lots of them. They do, let's just go back. They do lots of things. And I made the point that the standard is actually a very brief statement, and that the bulk of those documents that we use are the guidance notes. The guidance represents, in some way, best practice, or maybe just good practice. But the point being that the standard is what you really have to do, and the guidance is what you should do, because if you don't, you need to have a jolly good explanation why. This is the, the in the end, if it all goes horribly wrong, and as, as Pete and Terry both said, somebody does something really stupid, and it goes to either a CIFA complaint process or, or, or grievance, or even worse, you get into a court of law. The guidance is what's gonna count, because that's what's good practice. And if you didn't follow good practice, in law, you're in a very vulnerable position. So that's, that's kind of the negative way of looking at that process of enforcement. And the positive side, of course, is that you are, if you are doing good practice, then you are most likely to achieve the maximum amount of benefits out of the project on behalf of the client. Because there wasn't anybody available there, but there is here, we have our chief executive of fame and they were in the audience here, so I'll duck questions if you want to ask. But in parallel with ACRA, the UK does have the Federation of Archaeological Managers and Employers. Nick's here as the chief executive. And I, I tried to go through as best I could to explain the, you are getting the short version, you realize, you know, I could have gone and bored you to tears with most of these points, but I won't. Uh, so FAME has its own separate remit from CIFA, and there is an overlap. Nick, how many organizations in FAME? 60? 57. 57. 
57 in, in fame, but 77 in, in, in the RO scheme, and there is a lot of overlap, but not, they are not the same. And that's interesting, probably indicates there's a fair bit of work to be done on both sides, but uh, that, that is a, a very interesting and useful reflection of the real world out there in commercial archaeology. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so there's, there, there are the responsibilities of fame and, and what fame tries to do and how they play into the performance of commercial archaeology in the UK. Um, and I think that the, the CIFA and the fame strands together um, have proved to be quite effective. I had the, the benefit over the last year or two to work with two of the ROs, both represented in this room, on a very large project. And because the project just happened to have really good archaeology, I spent a lot of time out on site. And uh, I spent often at least one full day every week and often two days. And because of that, I got to know the people on site well enough that I could sit on the side of the trench and just talk to the crew chief, uh, the supervisors, crew chiefs in American parlance, and the excavators. And in, in, because I was interested, I would ask the simple questions like, why are you guys doing this? And nobody was there for the money. That doesn't surprise you. But these are, in fact, the answers that came back, that they were there because they thought they had something to offer society, that archaeology meant something not just to them, but to the people who lived in the town adjacent to where the excavation was going on. And, and that's the point at which you see the, the, the two little things there in the header. My, my own company is a commercial practice, but also that of the, of the Chartered Institute, where the two of them have finally come back together after a long time of working together from different angles in that push-pull situation of, develop, of working with commercial developers. That actually the, the political <coughs> measures, uh, messages that Pete gave right at the outset have, have become integrated into the way that everybody on that site 35, 40 archaeologists at a time. They were all thinking in these terms that archaeology is for the benefit of it all, of everyone, all, and that it therefore needs to be done well, and well means with professionalism. And it's CIFA that sets the standards. From my, my perspective, looking outwards to the commercial world, if you're commissioning archaeology, the only sensible thing to do is to use people who are professionals, and the measures are either RPA or CIFA. That's fine. I've got about one minute to go, Jen. Uh, you need to be using professional archaeologists, archaeologists, sorry. If you're doing archaeology, as are all of us, you need to be one because that's the way you demonstrate your own professionalism and your own competence. And if you do, society is the beneficiary of all that. Okay, political message ends. My, my talk ends before I kick the microphone. Uh, and that gives you a brief summary of the type of presentation that the four of us tried to go through in America. A bit of a dialogue between the four of us. We'll now open the dialogue up. And what we compiled is this, a, a discussion. This is to get you started just before we break for coffee. Is that legible, Pete? Uh, somebody, Mike, is that legible back there? Uh, I'm going to buy glasses. Hey, you got glasses <laughs> Kate, Andrea, can you read that? Yep. Okay, we, we compiled one table, which was an overview of the principal characteristics of the two organizations, RPA and CIFA, as a way, as a shorthand, an aide moi to discussion. So we'll leave it up there as a way of, of you trying to envisage the two organizations side by side, but also some of the, the rows there at the table would also serve as a reminder for the things that happen outside of the two organizations in the worlds of heritage management, archaeological management in the two countries. All right, so on that, I'll hand back to Jen.